The agenda this week pondered the path to peace between Israel and Palestine and poured over true tales with five nonfiction authors. The agenda's week in review begins, however, with a reflection on the life of Jim Flaherty. I thank you all for coming in on very short notice to, um, to join us and reminisce and assess a guy you all knew very well. Uh, Ernie Eves, start us off. What are you thinking right now? Well, I'm thinking what a sad day it is, uh, not just for Christine and her children, but for every Canadian. Um, Jim was a tremendous person. I mean, first class individual, uh, a very de dedicated public servant. Uh, a side of Jim, though, that not a lot of people got to see, I don't think, was A, he had a great sense of humor, and uh, B, he really was there for all the right reasons. He was there to help people who were less fortunate in society you know, be able to be the best that they could be. And we all talk about his great record as finance minister, and indeed it was a great record. He'll probably go down as the greatest finance minister in the history of, of the country of Canada. You think so? Yes, I think so. Because of the difficult economic times that the country was in when he was finance minister for much of his eight years there. Also, he led the rest of the Western world, I believe, in, in the recent recession. Uh, he led, they followed. And he, in his uh, indomitable fashion, would berate them at times when he thought perhaps some of them weren't coming along quite the way he thought they should. Uh, that would be true Jim Flaherty again. He was very, very you know, passionate about the things he believed in and wanted to get them done. But the other side was he had a great Irish sense of humor. He was a great storyteller. He was an avid hockey fan. And he, uh, for example, when I ran against him for the leadership, uh, I remember having a long discussion with him the morning after. and. He, he likened it to a hockey game. He said, you know, the game is over. Somebody wins, somebody loses. Let's get on with it. And that was his attitude. And it always was Jim's attitude. And in subsequent years, uh, I just recently saw him in Ottawa a few months ago when I was there on behalf of Special Olympics Canada seeking funding, which he granted us for, for, for a five-year term. Mm -hmm. And that's the side of Jim, um, learning disabled people, young children. He was passionate about that. He was passionate about helping kids with autism. He was passionate about Special Olympics and help, helping kids be the best that they could possibly be. He was there for all the right reasons. Okay, Elizabeth Whitmer, to you now. Recollections of Jim Flaherty. What are, what are you thinking right now? Well, I uh, received the news today as I was driving from uh, my personal assistant, and uh, she had heard a rumor on Twitter and said, uh, you know, I hear Jim is gravely ill, and before too long, as she was talking to me, we, we got the news that he had passed away. and. I will tell you, I was very sad. Um, he was a remarkable human being, and I think not all people knew the true Jim. The true Jim was a very disciplined person. Um, he was hardworking. He, he could be tough. Uh, he certainly took strong positions, but he also was very respectful and was prepared to listen to the other side as well. But he was also very passionate about people and um, he, he really has done a lot throughout his life, both he and Christine, for those people who have, have disabilities. And, um, and, you know, he often had a twinkle in his eye. I think that's something I remember. He did have a sense of humor, but he had a twinkle in his eye. And um, he, he truly was a remarkable human being. And I think he, he is going to be remembered as a great, great Canadian. And he very, very quickly, once he got to Queen's Park, uh, in 1995, uh, started to exert a lot of influence within our caucus and within our cabinet. And of course, both Premier Harris and Premier Eves uh, looked to him for leadership in, in cabinet. So, uh, you know, you can count, you could count on Jim to do the job and to do it well. Janet Ecker. Well, I think, uh, and actually Elizabeth mentioned it, that sort of Irish uh, impish uh, part of him, which you sometimes saw a flash of. But uh, what was really interesting about Jim, I mean, when he and I, we were sort of uh, uh, candidates together, if you will, before we won election in 95. And uh, the two of us uh, and our other colleagues out in Durham region will get together before the election, meet regularly to talk about what we could do if we all got elected to help Durham region. Um, and uh, 
uh, and when he, when you know, when we we did, and he was true to his word. I mean, things like the Highway 407 expansion into the riding, the Durham University, the the Ability Center, which is a state of the art uh, uh, facility for uh, families with children with disabilities. I mean, it was a really long list, and uh, so it was always good to 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 be able to work with them, even when you know we didn't agree from time to time on the odd issue. Um, that was okay too, because at the end of the day, I mean, Ernie said it well. You know, I mean, you're there to do what you think is right. You're there to make decisions, to argue for what you think is right. And uh, but at the end of the day, we work together to do a lot of good things out in, in Durham Region. And so uh, I admired him. I respected him. He's been incredibly supportive of what we've been trying to do for building the uh, Toronto financial services industry. Uh, we established the, the Global Risk Institute uh, to sort of uh, help uh, leverage our global reputation and risk management. I mean, it, it's just the list of things that that man accomplished uh, in provincial politics, federal politics, um, is just phenomenal. It's a very long legacy. Okay, all, all of you knew him, obviously, as a caucus or cabinet mm -hmm. colleague. You did not. You were a guy who was on the other side of the floor, sparring with him, perhaps. So what's your take on him? Well, that reminds me of, uh, I think, a good story. I remember Jim sitting in the front bench, uh, probably between Ernie and, uh, uh, and one of, or both, uh, my two distinguished female colleagues here. And I was looking at him, uh, trying to think, who does he look like? He reminds me of somebody. And uh, finally, the penny dropped. And I went over, because he saw me looking. And he said, have you got a problem? And I said, well, I'm <laughs> trying to figure out who you look like. And I said, I finally figured out who it is. And it's a young Jack Dempsey. Uh, the and he was quite flattered by that. The prize fighter, uh, <laughs> the uh, famous Irish American yeah, 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 heavyweight he would, champion, he would, yeah. and uh, Ernie reminded me of this. That um, when I think of Jim Flaherty, I think of someone who liked his politics muscular. Um, he was kind of a male edition of Betty Stevenson. I mean, he really did like to be engaged. He didn't. There wasn't very much neutral about Jim, as far as I could tell. He was iconoclastic. He would come at you sometimes, as I suspect. Uh, Janet uh, and others here know from perhaps a slightly different angle. I, I remember, for example, his views on, on the homeless were, were quite, shall we say, idiosyncratic uh, relative to the rest of the political class. But he was very independent. Uh, he was not afraid to take a position. Uh, and as I think is quite obvious from the, uh, the outpouring on Parliament Hill, a place today that is quite, uh, quite a different place than it's been in, in recent decades. Uh, someone who clearly was really well regarded by all his colleagues. It's one thing to hear the Prime Minister and members of the government caucus saying nice things, but uh, the leader of the opposition, Mr. Mulcair, was visibly moved, I thought, in his comments. I thought Charlie Angus, who's quite a colorful New Democrat from Northern Ontario, had a wonderful story about being in Rome with Jim Flaherty recently, and uh, he, he conjured up an image that I think if, if, uh, if you knew um, uh, Jim, as, as Elizabeth Whitmer has said, uh, there was a, a quality about him that you just could not help but like. Would you say that democracy in Ontario in particular, in Canada in general, has become an elitist institution? Well, I think we probably have to put this in a bit of a historical context. Um, after all, a democracy has changed a lot. If we were to go back and look at the beginning, it, I think it's fair to say that democracy was always elite in some ways. Certainly in the early days it was. Aboriginal people and uh, women weren't a part of it to begin with. Uh, there's a second phase, though, that if we look in the post-war period, it's interesting. Was we, as governments began to build the welfare state, they began to look on us as having uh, individual responsibility to citizens, and I think that engaged us in a new way. We might be getting into, a, in fact, I would say we are getting into a third phase, and that third, third phase now over the last 30 years or so, uh, we're a lot more educated, we're a lot more aware, we're a lot more involved, uh, and I think it's uh, people have become a much more, their attitudes are changing, much more demanding in two ways in particular. Certainly people want governments to be more accountable and more transparent in a way they did in the past. And maybe the most interesting part is the, the, the sense that they should have a say on things they want to have a say on. Traditionally governments kind of were elected to, government, to govern uh, and people let them govern. Now I think there's a real tension between that and people may feel if they don't get a say that in fact we really are living in a pretty in elite world. Nancy Peckford, how about your view? Is it more elitist today than ever? 
Well, like Don, I, I would suggest that, in fact, our, our institutions have always been to some degree uh, elitist, and certainly when you look at uh, gender and other underrepresented groups, uh, the reality is is that our institutions were formed well before women and, and many other groups had the right to vote, and still those institutions function in a way that we argue sometimes excludes or discourages uh, those groups from getting involved. And if the face of your institutions doesn't meaningfully reflect those uh, who you purport to represent, then I do think you have considerable challenges. And I would like to note that, you know, obviously we've seen some tremendous success on the part of uh, women over the last 30 to 40 years. But at the same time, we're looking at 25% women on average in political institutions across the country. Only 16% of Canada's mayors are female. And as you know, we went from a historic high of six female premiers to now three, and even uh, that number is in question. So Equal Voice is really out to change the game because we do think our political institutions really haven't caught up with the times. Heather, what do you say? I would say that uh, there is a huge amount of opportunity uh, right now in democracy for engagement for uh, n not necessarily uh, just elite, but the politics has got a lot more comfort complicated in the last little mm -hmm. while and just because we have social media and twi Twitter so I can get in touch with you doesn't mean everybody has social media and Twitter those skills require a special expertise and that's uh, shutting some of the electorate out of the conversation which mm -hmm. is a bit dangerous uh, I, I hear you but like most people are on Twitter now aren't they uh, most you tell people, me. Um, no, I would say mo a lot of Canadians are uh, uh, a lot of Canadians are on Twitter. They're not talking about politics on Twitter, and, and uh, a whole lot of Canadians are not on Twitter. Uh, they don't even have a lot of Canadians don't have uh, computers or access to computers. Cell phones, yes, access to computers, no. Okay, that's funny because I'll tell you what. I hear from everybody on Twitter, but that's another story. You hear from everybody who's on Twitter. <laughs> yes, no, that's a fair point. <laughs> and, and some days it just feels like it's everybody. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yes no, I the, the entire country, yeah. yeah. Okay, Desmond, where are you coming down on this? Uh, democracy as an elitist institution. I think that um, over time we've been trying to move away from uh, power being concentrated in the hands of a few and making our democracy open and more accessible. I don't think we're anywhere near there yet. I think we've been moving in that direction. I wouldn't say that we've lost a uh, sense of democracy being for the people and it's become more elitist. I think we've been going in the other direction the whole time. And I think that um, it's what's troubling is that when you look at something like participation in political parties, you know, it's I think 5% in Canada. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people in our country don't feel like they belong to the institutions of democracy, that they don't feel like it's for them. They don't feel like someone is inviting them to come and participate. And I, I you know, we live in a consumer culture where people say, what's in it for me? And so I think that if we want people to participate, we have to get used to the idea that they want to know what value they're going to get for their contribution. Nahid, how about you? Well, I think, um, so part of the discussion around um, institutions as being sort of the home of the elites, um, one of the things we don't really talk about is racial and class representation within these institutions. Um, and I think that that is actually, I mean, there's almost no racial and class diversity within these institutions. And so you do see that, um, you know, people are getting pulled into the system, but within their own communities, these are also people who are, um, you know, closer to the elites. And so I, I feel like there's a problem with the structure of the institutions themselves um, and the way that these institutions interact with the population in general, I don't think that we really have um, a democratic sentiment. Um, I think that a lot of people, especially newer Canadians... Sorry, say that again? We well, don't have a democratic sentiment? I don't think we do. I don't think that we feel that these institutions... I think we have this idea that, um, you know, ideally these institutions are there to serve the broad public, um, but we don't act that way. We don't um, act in a way as though, for example, government is for everybody. Government is really hard to access. Um, you know, getting a government job is incredibly difficult. Um, finding your way around a government website. Uh, have you ever tried to interact with, you know, Citizenship and Immigration Canada? I mean, it's, it's a ridiculous labyrinth. And so we have these institutions that we, I think, um, not like to pretend, but I think that we've convinced ourselves that they're very open and transparent, well, but they're not. L let me, uh, Don, let, let me get you to follow up on that. Is it not the case in Canada today that if you have, let's say, an issue around immigration, you can make an appointment to see your member of parliament at his or her constituency office at a time of mutual convenience and figure it out? Do we not live in that world anymore? 
Uh, well, I think we do live in that world. The real question is, uh, for most of the problems that people have and the current concerns they have, how much impact is their member likely to have? Indeed, how much impact is their government likely to have? If I can just take a bit of a detour here, Steve, I'd say one thing. If something that has changed over the last 30 years is the way that we think about issues and maybe even the issues themselves. Think about the environment. 30 years ago, we thought it was something that was relatively self-contained. Today, everybody talks about sustainable, environment, uh, sustainable development, which means the environment and the economy are are closely connected. You can't think about one without the other. And I guess what I'd say is as these changes are taking place and we become more aware of how interconnected things are, uh, governments continue to promise us big things like jobs and a better economy and sustainable development. But at the end of the day, we start realizing how complex these things are. And I think there's a lot of doubt and even a lack of trust about government's ability to deliver on the promises it makes. I appreciate that. But Nancy, th th those, are, those are macro issues. That's very right. sort of big picture stuff. Uh, let's get it a little more down to, um, you know, the, the streets, right. the sidewalks, yeah. the, the stuff, uh, brass tacks. Is it not the yeah. case that if you've got a problem with something going on in government, you can meet with your MP and discuss it? That's the, the most basic aspect of democracy, is that you can meet your representative and deal with these issues. Doesn't that happen anymore? Oh, certainly I think it, it does happen, but I, I would agree that I think that people are a little bit detached from their political institutions and depending on the circles you run in and, and how you understand the political process, um, you're not necessarily inclined uh, to pick up the phone to your MP or your MPP as a first step. But you know, equal voice is, is actually quite encouraged by the number of women in particular who are actually very, very uh, eager to get engaged in the political process. And what we're trying to do is really think about how do we make sure that those institutions really signal an open door. And for example, uh, you know, we've spent a lot of time contemplating the kind of gotcha politics culture that we're currently in. And really, who does that serve in the kind of character assassination of those in elected office, and particularly women in elected office. And how do we ensure that those institutions are receptive to not only Canadians in general, but those who are serving in them? And how do we cultivate a culture so that the people who are in those institutions are, are actually portrayed as real human beings who, in fact, are accessible? These have started and stopped numerous times over numerous years. What consistently causes them to fail in your view? Steve, these negotiations have gone on now for 21 years and the reason that they are failing is for two main reasons. One is that Israel doesn't recognize the applicability of international law. And the second main reason is because the United States and the international community have never forced Israel to recognize the applicability of international law. What this means is that you're going into a negotiation without any framework, without any fr terms of reference, and it ends up being a question of, of which str party is stronger, who has the power. And the problem is, is that all the while, Palestinians are still living under Israeli military rule. So there needs to be a framework. There needs to be international law applied, just as it has been applied in other conflicts around the world. And there needs to be an honest broker, not the United States, which is co consistently on the side of Israel. With that, those are the two things that have been missing throughout all of these negotiations. And if they don't come to play, we're going to see these negotiations continue for yet another 21 years, with more settlements going up and more Palestinians losing their lives and more Palestinian land loss. What would you attribute the failure of the talks to for two decades? Well, I think they never got even close to uh, get close to the, the minimum uh, uh, position of the other side, where the other side can, can agree. Uh, second, they have been mainly about bargaining and not uh, reconciliation. Even at the height of the, of the Oslo process, you know, it behaviorally, uh, they looked the same, reconciliation or bargaining, but they were actually bargaining. Israel was uh, creating more, more settlements and more facts in the ground, and Palestinians were, were blowing up in, in, in buses and bases in, in Israel. But I think, you know, uh, I'll leave international law for, for a second, because uh, international law is important, but I think that uh, this, is a, this is a conflict of 100 years, and in order to, to be able to move forward, and get to that point of reconciliation. It never, it never got there. I repeat, uh, there are some, there are many obstacles that need to be uh, overcome. One certainly is, is the uh, are the settlements because the settlements, in in large part, were put there. Not only, I mean, there are people who believe that you know for messianic reasons that's why they are there, but 
that's that's one of the main I issues that that prevent a settlement in terms of. Do you agree they're a, a blockade to peace at the moment? I agree that that obviously because they uh, uh, if if there will be a two-state solution, which is my my preferred solution, mm -hmm. uh, 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 and, and and actually I could even say more. Uh, because of demographic reasons and other reasons, I don't think I have the time to, to begin talking about them. Uh, it is not only in, in, in Palestinian interest, and she would talk about her Palestinian interest better than I can, uh, for us Israelis to uh, get out of the territories. Because, you know, in terms of one of the standing blocks right now in the present negotiations, you know, the Jewish state. Mm -hmm. uh, issue. For me, the Jewish state is a matter of uh, not talk, but facts. Okay, well, hold that thought, because yeah. we'll get to that in a second. You mentioned the honest broker, and that yes. you don't believe the United States is yeah. the honest broker anymore. Yeah. It's interesting, because if you polled Israelis, they probably 97% would say Barack Obama is in the tank for the other side. Mm -hmm. They don't think Obama is pro-Israel. Obviously, we understand uh, Palestinians do. If it's not America, who is the honest broker who could get this done? It's not a question of who is going to get it done. It's a question of whether they're actually going to implement and uphold international law. And there is the ability to have other parties involved. In fact, they put together the, the quartet. The quartet consists of the EU, the US, uh, Russia, and the United Nations. And that body has largely been, been uh, also coming under the U.S. thumb. So the question is not who it is, but what it is that they're doing. And leaving it simply to the United States, the United States has always said that they're going to back Israel and always stand on the side of Israel. It makes it clear that they're not the honest broker. We need somebody who's going to be a law enforcer. For example? And for example, it could be the European Union. It could be a combination of the European Union as well as the United Nations. There, there are many, many examples that are out there. Does America have too strong an interest in the region to give up that role? Yes, it plays not not only too strong of, a, of a, an interest in the, the region itself, but also for domestic reasons, that it, it's, it has failed in its, uh, in its, in its role as being uh, a superpower. Sometimes negotiations fail because of the players involved, and sometimes it's just a bad process. The process is flawed. Since there have been so many starts and failures, Let's take the players out of it for a second. Is this just the wrong process, Emmanuel? What do you think? I, I think that, I mean, you didn't mention one other thing, which is structure. There are structural reasons, and this is what I was pointing uh, before, and I just mentioned to start with uh, the, uh, uh, the settlements. But at the same time, it's, it's 1948. It's Nakba. So we are dealing... The catastrophe. The catastrophe. Nakba. And we are dealing here with uh, a, a situation in which the two sides have completely different narratives of the same reality. Yeah. And, and people who, you know, in the peace camps on both sides have sat together, tried to bring these two narratives together, and they couldn't. They just raised their hand. Because they, 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 the way they, uh, the two sides uh, identify reality. In 2011, the federal government launched a $10 million project to advance our understanding of the causes of terrorism. As part of that project, the Mosaic Institute has released a study examining the perceptions and reality of imported conflict into Canada. To what extent do residents from conflict zones bring that tension with them? And joining us now to help answer that, Rima Burns-McGowan. She's a professor of diaspora studies at the University of Toronto. And John Monaghan, he's executive director from the Mosaic Institute. They collaborated on this study, and we're happy to have both of you here in our studio tonight. Thank Thanks, you. Sir. Okay, John, start us off here with the background. How did you put this study together? Well, <clears throat> it started with a conversation between the Mosaic Institute and the folks at Public Safety Canada who uh, were looking for research proposals related to the topic of how to prevent and address terrorism in Canada. And we were interested, but didn't claim to be experts in terrorism. We do have a real interest and somewhat of an expertise, though, in social cohesion and how Canadians get along with each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the proposal that was ultimately accepted was one that would look at how this phenomenon if it is one, of imported conflicts, affects the cohesion between Canadians, how they attach to each other and attach to Canada. And whom did you talk to, or how did you decide whom to talk to? Well, the, there's a terrific team at Public Safety Canada that heads up the Kanishka Project on behalf of the Government of Canada. 
although there are many other agencies and departments involved in the project, they just happen to be the point of contact for organizations like ours. And Rima, what did you find out? Well, the fascinating thing is that most Canadians believe that people who come from conflict import it with them. But the fact is, we do not import violent conflict to Canada. We did extensive one-on-one um, -on -one interviews with 220 people who come from eight different conflict-afflicted regions and we talked to people from all sides with all different perspectives, people who are deeply invested in conflict. Every single person to a person repudiated the use of violence in Canada to resolve the conflict back home for two reasons, both because it's morally and ethically wrong and because they do not believe that it's going to advance their cause. And this is even people who think that militant resistance to something back home is all right, but here it's not. And that is the single most powerful finding. There was a lot else, however. We found that we don't import conflict, violent conflict, but we do import trauma. And untreated trauma is a real problem. Then as well, we also, the darker the color of your skin, or the more, as I say, that you perform your identity or your religion on your body or your clothing, the more likely you are to face systemic racism. We've got five minutes left here, which is, I guess, a minute to each of you on, we know that a great book can change people's lives. And I want to know how these great books changed your life. Thomas. Well, um, it allowed me to tell the story of Native people in North America. It also allowed me to go back and relive part of my past because in part, I was part of that history, at least a small part of it. And while it opened up old wounds, I, I, I'll have to admit that it did that, it also allowed me to clarify some of my thoughts on that history and to get some ideas. So when people ask me, so what can we do about this situation that we have on our hands, at least I had a couple of uh, uh, semi-intelligent answers that I could come up with. Uh, so it did that for me. Uh, what it does for readers, I have no idea. No, no, I'm only asking about you. Okay. Graham, how did this book change your life, writing the book? It was very similar, actually. Uh, it was sort of a, a form of therapy. Um, I, it was stuff I had to get off my chest, stuff I had to sit down and, and think about. Um, you know, as I say, I, I, I think in many ways it encouraged me, you know, to stop you know, running around battlefields. Um, you know, you go back and you listen to the audio recordings and you, and you can hear again just how close you, you got sometimes. And uh, so it was good uh, education for myself. David, writing this book, how did it change your life? Well, I suppose what it did for me was help me reconnect or connect more uh, to, to engage more with Vancouver itself, where I lived, because I wasn't born there, so I didn't have that sort of uh, same kind of nostalgic investment in the city at all. Um, I've worked there, but um, Arthur Erickson was rethinking the genres of buildings, and these ideas were important. I began to realize this, this, this architect really did deserve the kind of you know, fame that he, that he enjoyed for quite a while. Um, yeah, I suppose that, that, that's it. You, you, you just live more in your city that way. You get Vancouver better now. I do, yeah. Nice. JB. I think this book solved a bit of a puzzle for me because I've, ever since childhood, I've paid a lot of attention to the natural world. I've spent a lot of time in remote and wild and backcountry kind of places. And I've always wondered why they seemed a little bit oddly empty, you know, that much of the continent, much of the world seems kind of oddly empty to me. And, uh, and I, I could never make sense of that until I started doing the research for this book and realized, well, it's, it's because we have depleted the planet to, to such an extent. And out of that, I get both this sense of loss, you know, there's a, a certain, almost a grief associated with it, but at the same time, a sense of inspiration, you know, a, a, a more hopeful attitude that we can rebuild something like that in the future. It is a good point. We shouldn't assume that there have only been positive changes to all of your lives as a result of having written your books you did experience some negative consequences as a result of writing it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's a, a, some of the, at one point I talk in the book about 
getting to the point where I just felt like I was stacking skulls in a crypt. You know, at a certain point, uh, that's how it feels. It's going to have that, you know, all, all of those losses pile up, but then you have to push beyond that as well to, to see what's, what's behind the, the wall. <laughs> Charlotte. I guess it did, writing The Massey Murder did two things for me. One was it sort of it reinforced my amazement at how Canada has evolved and how it continues to evolve. And I think it's really, as I said earlier, it's really important to look back at only a hundred years at how different this, this country was then. Mm -hmm. The other thing that it really brought home to me was how malleable the law is. I mean, a lot of the Massey murder is the trial scene, and, and Carrie, who shot her boss, had a very, very good lawyer. And um, he got her off. She walked. I mean, it's no secret. And what that really brought home to me, I mean, we tend to think of the law as a completely black and white, written on tablets system. And in fact, it's so malleable. It just reflects the current values at the time. You see this in The Inconvenient Indian, too. I mean, it's just... The, we construct these laws, uh, and they're constructed in that point by male politicians, uh, but they're only a snapshot of the attitudes at the time. Uh, as I thank all of you for coming in tonight to do this program, it has just occurred to me this moment that I have most of these books in the wrong place. So, Charlotte Gray, thank you for coming in and for the Massey murder. David Stouck for Arthur Erickson, An Architect's Life. Graham Smith, for the dogs are eating them now. JB, I actually got yours right. You're in the right spot. JB McKinnon, for the once and future world. And Thomas King, the inconvenient Indian, belongs here. Thanks so much, RBC Taylor Prize nominees. Great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. And that is the Agenda's Week in Review. You can see all of those programs in their entirety on our website, theagenda.tvo.org on our iTunes channel or on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.